Okay, who, when they read the sermon title, started singing? Nobody? I mean, I expected you at least to start singing when you read the sermon title. No, not you, your, your mother. What's the sermon title? Miss Wands. I thought Miss Wands would have been singing when she... So we have no CSI fans in the, in the group? Here? So the, what's the song? There you go. And let's not, let's not actually sing all of the whole song because some of it's not really appropriate for worship. So don't sing the whole thing. For younger ears, make sure you get the uh, approved version to listen to there. But, it's, I mean, it's an interesting song, right? It, it asks a good question. A question that we get asked over and over and over again throughout our days. Who are you? It's easy to answer with your name, right? I'm Jerry Wortley. What does that tell you? Nothing, if you don't know who Jerry Wortley is. Other than that's my name. And then you could go Google it. Um, make sure you have a strong constitution. If you Google my name, you don't, I don't know what you're going to find. So I'm the guy that wore uh, Hello Kitty glasses at the beginning of worship today. So it could be interesting what you'd find. But it's a, it's a question, right? And you can answer that many different ways. Like if somebody asks me who I am, I can tell them my name. Or I can tell them that I am a pastor. That tells you a little bit. I could tell you that I have multiple holes in my head. That tells you something. I could tell you that I am a husband. I could tell you that I am a father. I could tell you that I am a brother. I could tell you that I am a musician. I could tell you that I am a disciple. I can tell you I'm a follower of Christ. Do any of these things actually completely give you a clear picture of who I am? Do they give, you a, do they give me a clear picture of who I am? This text that we have this morning out of the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John is an interesting text because it's a continuation of what we had last week, right? I am the vine, you are the branches, remain in me and you will bear much fruit. No one can bear fruit unless you're connected with me. And then at verse, six, verse 9, it starts like almost a whole new section even though it's the exact same thing that Jesus is talking about, right? Jesus has just left the Last Supper. We have to remember this, the timeline for this passage of Scripture Jesus just left the Last Supper. He just sat down the last time with his 12 disciples, washed their feet, sent Judas out to do what it is that you have to do. Now he's walking through the Kidron Valley with the rest of his disciples through a vineyard, talking about how we all have to stay connected. And then he's saying how I'm the vine and you're the branches. And if you remain in me, if you abide in me, you're going to bear much fruit. And then he starts talking about love. Interesting facts here. Chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, the word love does not exist. Starting at verse 9 through 17, the word love happens nine times. I don't think it's a mistake. I think Jesus is trying to make a point. And the interesting thing, if you read these verses, read them again later, they speak nothing of the disciples' love for Jesus or for God. They don't say that the disciples should love God. At all. That's other places in the Bible. Don't get me wrong. Jesus does say that the disciples should love God. But here in chapter 15 of the Gospel of John, as Jesus is talking about the vine and the branches, and then he moves on to talk about love and how we should abide in his love, he doesn't tell us that we should love God. He says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, and you should abide in that love. As the Father has loved me. Think about that one for a moment. And let that just sink in. As God loves Jesus, Jesus loves you. As God loves Jesus, Jesus loves you. And then the last verse of our reading. You did not choose me. I chose you. See, the interesting part in all of this is 
choice on whether or not God and Jesus love you. You have no choice whatsoever. Whether you believe it or not, Jesus loves you. Whether you accept it or not, Jesus loves you. And it really comes down to that understanding of who we are, right? How many of you, if you were ever asked to give clarifying words as I did at the beginning of this sermon, of who you are, would you list out disciple? Don't raise your hands. We already had confession. I don't want to give you a moment that you have to have something else to confess about. <laughs> How many of you would use the word distinct disciple? as a demarcator of who you are? How many of you would use the word follower of Christ to tell someone that's who you are? How many of you would use the word Christian to tell somebody that that's who you are? See, the interesting part to this is this gospel was written supposedly by a man named John. And who is John? Well, he could be John the brother of James who is one of the sons of Zebedee. He could be another John altogether. But who is John in the Gospel of John? Is John ever mentioned by name in the Gospel of John? No, he's not. He's actually not. Anytime that John is referred to in the Gospel of John, how is he referred to? The disciple that Jesus loves. It's interesting. There's a book by Philip Yancey called What's So Amazing About Grace? And in this book, Philip Yancey talks about this story about how he received in the mail a postcard from one of his friends. From, he had gone to, his friend had gone to a seminar someplace and Philip had received in the mail his postcard from his friend and it had, it had only a few words on it. In those few, six words it had on it, it said, I am the one Jesus loves. That's all the postcard said. He looked at the return address. He got, a, he got a little giggle out of it. He called his friend to talk to him about it. And he said that he had heard it from the speaker Brandon Manning at a seminar. Manning referred to Jesus' closest friend on earth. The disciple named John identified in the Gospels as the one who Jesus loved. Manning said if John were to be asked, what is your primary identity in life? He would not reply that I am a disciple, that I am an apostle, that I am one of the evangelists, that I am an author of one of the Gospels in the New Testament. He would say, I am the one that Jesus loves. How many of you would answer the question, who are you and what is your major demarcator in life, would answer that question with, I am the one that Jesus loves? Probably none of us because it's Pretty bold statement. But it's absolutely true. What would it mean, Yancey continues, I asked myself, if I too came to the place where I saw my primary identity in life as the one who Jesus loves, how differently would I view myself at the end of the day? Sociologists have a theory of the looking glass self. How many of you ever heard of this? I had, actually hadn't heard of it until, until I read all of this stuff out of Nancy's book. You become what, you, what, is, what the most important person in your life thinks you are. The most important person in your life, be that your wife, your father, your boss, your mother, your sister, your brother, your significant other, your whatever that is. You become who you who they think you are because of their the way that they interact with you and the way that they tell you who you are you become that person in the looking glass self how would my life change if i truly believed the bible's astounding words about god's love for me and if i looked in the mirror and i saw what god sees how would your life change if you believe what it says here in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John that I have loved you as the Father has loved me. And I didn't choose you. You didn't choose me, but I chose you. And I love you just as God loves me. How would our lives change if when we looked in the mirror we believed the fact that Jesus loves us? As we are. Regardless of what we've done, what we are doing, 
for what we will do. Jesus loves you. It's not your choice. Brandon Manning tells another story of an Irish priest who on a walking tour of a rural parish sees an old peasant kneeling by the side of the road praying. Impressed, the priest says to the, to the man, you must be very close to God. And the peasant looks up from his prayers, thinks for a moment, and then he smiles and he replies, yes, he is very fond of me. What if we believed just that? That Jesus is very fond of us. Remembering that you didn't choose to follow God. That Christ chose you and gave you the power and the faith and the grace and the mercy to be able to cling to God who loves you beyond all comparison. Who sent His Son to die on a cross so that we could have a relationship with Him. God loves you more than you can fathom. And He chose you. Just like He chose me. And He asks us to abide in His love, to live in that vine, to produce that fruit, to be intermingled and intertwined and reliant upon those around us, but abiding in the fact that regardless of who's around us and who's supporting us, that Jesus loves us and claims us and names us just as we are. So if nothing else this morning, if nothing else this week, hear the fact that Jesus loves you just as you are. That Jesus chose you just as you are. Regardless of what you're doing, regardless of where you're going, and that He's always there to walk with you. How will your life change if you believe that God is very fond of you and that you are the one that Jesus loves.